And don't go thinking that it's only six verses. We're going to get out of here early tonight. because <laughs> I've got lots of material, so just, just hold on and, and bear with me. But it's really good material. The book of Psalms, especially these first 10, 15, I mean, there's like so much great kind of, all of it's great, all of it's the word of God, but like there's, there's a lot of things that uh, a lot of great truth and wisdom that we're going to get. So I'm excited about the book of Psalms here. But let's dig into this. Basically, Psalm 1, where you see right off the beginning, right, the first few words, it says, blessed is the man. And basically, Psalm 1, you could read, and if you want to be blessed, if you want God to bless you, if you want to be a blessed man, let's read Psalm 1. It's going to tell you what to be and what not to be, what to do and what not to do, even in just these six short chapters, verses, chapters, verses. Blessed is the man that walketh not. So here's something that you don't do. If you want to be blessed, if you want things going well for you, if you want God blessing your life, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. One of the things that stuck out to me when I read this, and especially studying on this chapter in, 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 um, in preparation for the sermon it's how he says, I don't want you to walk, I don't want you to stand, and I don't want you to sit with these groups of people. And basically, you know, the ungodly, the way of sinners, the seat of the scornful, this is referring to the same types of people. He says, don't walk with them, don't be joined up with them, don't, don't even stand in the way that they stand in, don't, don't stand in that way, and don't sit down with them. If you want to be blessed, stay as far away as possible from this group of people, from people who are ungodly. Now, I want to focus and actually spend quite a bit of time on that first part of walk if not in the counsel of the ungodly because this is actually very important and many people get strayed away and turned around because of ungodly counsel which can come from many, many directions. But what does it mean to be ungodly? Who is ungodly? Well, look at Verses 4, 5, and 6 in this chapter, we're going to look at that because um, this pretty much just defines ungodly people. It says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which, driveth with the, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So does it sound like this is talking about saved people or unsaved people? I mean, right off the bat, it's pretty simple, right? It's talking about people who are not saved because they're not going to stand in the judgment. They're referred to as sinners. The, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish, right? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the ungodly is talking about people who are not saved. Very simple. Because anybody who's not saved is not going to be godly. I mean, I, may, I mean, I know this, this, sound, this is real deep doctrine, right? But it's important to just establish this and lay this out because what is counsel? Counsel is advice. Counsel is something that you're going to receive from someone. Someone's going to give you advice or going to counsel you what you should be doing, what, how are they going to help you, you know, what's going to better your life counselors will help you to be a blessed person, right? At least that's their job. That's their function. That should be their goal. But that is not what they're going to do. You will not be blessed when you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly. It's obvious that an unsaved person is not going to be godly. Now, you have various unsaved people. Some are worse than others. And look, we're all sinners, but do you really want to trust someone that doesn't have the Spirit of God residing in them because they're not saved to give you guidance or counsel in your life? I mean, how we live our life is pretty important. The world has lots of counselors. And from their worldly perspective, they want to help you, right? They want to do what's right, but they do it without God. That is ungodly counsel by definition. It's ungodly. It's not godly counsel. It's ungodly counsel. And this idea of people going to psychiatrists and going to all of the world's counselors to solve their problems 
has gotten a little bit too accepted, I believe, within the church and the way things ought to be. And unfortunately, these days we have too many people now, instead of going and seeking godly counsel from people who know the Bible well, people who can provide wisdom from Scripture and really provide good answers that they are seeking from God's holy word that will help them to be blessed in their life, they go off and seek ungodly counsel. Now, let me ask you this. When you're having a problem in your life, when you're either involved in sin or not at all, you have problems happening in your life, and you go and seek ungodly counsel, do you think they're going to tell you that you need to get in church more? You need to be studying your Bible. You need to go out so You need to do things that God says to do. Are they going to give you anything like that? No, of course not. If anything, they're probably going to say, you know what, maybe you're going to church a little bit too much. Why don't you back off of that a little bit and do something that gives you more joy? Why don't you go pick up some more hobbies? Why don't you go camping? Why don't you go, you know, why don't you do all of these other things? Because that's the world's perspective. Of course, they're not going to endorse doing anything that the Bible would say is good and right. But when you, when you listen to that, when you go off and do these things, how can you expect to be blessed of God? How can you expect that? Now look, we know that these words are life. We covered this just recently that this is instruction for us. God has given us everything that we need to know to live a joyful and blessed life in this lifetime. We, we have the information here. It's actually relatively simple. We end up complicating things because our situations are always so different and complicated. You understand this. But that's also why it's good to have a counselor to help you untangle that mess that could actually see a little bit more clearly because when we get involved in things directly, everything is tangled, everything's taking you. Oh, you don't quite understand this. But a wise outside observer will be able to cut through all of those things that are making you not really want to see the proper instruction because they're not in the middle of it. It's easier sometimes to, to you know, as, as we were talking about earlier, um, before church started, you know, someone that may be very close to you, when someone asks, are they saved? You know, in, in my mind, I think of certain family members and I go, you know, I don't really know if they're saved. But if it was someone just a total different, you know, just some other stranger and someone was telling me this story of like, well, hey, my family member believes this and this and this. And also I'd just be like, well, they're not saved. Right. But because it's close to me, it, 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 you know, there's there's different attachments and other things that would make me maybe cloud my judgment a little bit. But that's why. And look, that's neither here nor there. Right. That that particular issue doesn't really matter that much because he's either saved or he's not. And, you know, it, it is what it is. But um, when it comes to your own problems and things that you need help with and things that you need advice with. Having a counselor, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, having a good counselor is going to help you tremendously because they'll be able to cut through all that stuff and give you the advice that you need to just be like, hey, this is what the, doesn't the Bible just say this? And then they'll be like, yeah, yeah, it does. You know, and you end up complicating things, but at the end of the day, it's like the Bible still says what it says and there's the instruction and it may not be exactly what you wanted to hear because you maybe were wanting to do something else, but it's what's best for you and it's what's needful and if it's coming, especially if it's coming from God's word. But when you go to the ungodly for your counsel, for your advice, it never works out. We've got a couple examples I want to look at. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 because we're going to see an example here of how extremely ungodly counsel can even cost you your life. It's so bad. Not just steer you down the wrong path and kind of make you miserable and get you into other problems because it's not, it's, it's worldly wisdom, it's not godly wisdom, but it can be so bad by taking the wrong counsel, it could literally cost you your life by, by going and seeking after ungodly counsel. Now, one way that people will seek counsel, will seek advice, 
these days and all throughout history is to do what? Go to a psychic, right? Let me go talk to a witch. They don't call them witches these days, but they'll call, you know, let me go get my cards read. Let me have someone go read my palm and, and, and look in their crystal ball and tell me what, what's the future going to hold. We know someone that, was, that would go to a psychic and to, to tell what, what gender our child was going to be when it was born. And, you know, it's easy to laugh that stuff off, but it's really sad for the person who goes to these people and is looking for this advice and they're looking for this knowledge and they're looking for wisdom. And it's in a completely wicked as hell place according to Scripture. God says, you know, the Bible says that thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And, you know, it's not like every single sin is worthy of the death penalty in the Bible. There are some that are listed off, but you start comparing the ones and be like, wow, I didn't even realize that must be very bad if God has a penalty of death on, on any sin, whatever the sin is. If he says, you know, because many of the punishments are, well, you're going you're gonna to pay a fine, right? Or you're going to get a beating or get a, a whipping or something like that. And, and that will satisfy the, the, the crime that you transgressed against somebody else. That's enough. But when he just says, well, the only way for justice to be served is for your life to be taken from you, that's pretty serious. I mean, you don't get another day to live. And that was his, his judgment on witches, on psychics, on these uh, prognosticators and these necromancers and these sorcerers that, that he says they deserve the death penalty. That is extremely wicked and ungodly counsel. No Christian ought to ever go, even in jest, even as a joke. That is, you know, we ought to, the Bible says that we ought to avoid the appearance of evil because it is evil. It's very wicked to go and seek counsel from these mediums and psychics and whatever. It is not of God at all. And it cost Saul, King Saul, his life. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse number 13. 1 Chronicles 10.13, the Bible says, So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. Is there any doubt in anyone's minds that the, of, of the cause of Saul's death? No. The Bible says he died for his transgression, for his sin that he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one <coughs> that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So what were the reasons why, why Saul died? Because he committed a trespass against the word of the Lord because he didn't keep God's word and for asking counsel of one that had a familiar, when he went to the witch at Endor and asked her, bring up Samuel because, and, and what was he doing? He needed counsel. He was about to go to battle and he tried to go to the Lord, but the you know, Lord wasn't listening to him because he was not listening to God. He was just, just off doing his own thing he wasn't getting an answer, so he's like, well, I'm going to go to a witch because I need counsel. I need advice on this war. And he went about it completely the wrong way. It was completely ungodly, and he died for it. Verse 14 says, And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom into, unto David, the son of Jesse. So he lost everything. Not only did he lose his life, but he lost his posterity too in the sense that the kingdom didn't go to Jonathan. The kingdom didn't go to any of Saul's sons. Jonathan died with Saul in battle. But it didn't even go to any of Saul's other sons. It went to David. So that honor of, of, of being able to pass down that kingdom and his family was gone. And it was a result of him ultimately sinning against God. And the Bible mentions here, it puts it in specifically, he sought counsel of, of one that had a familiar spirit. So that cost him his life. Turn if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. We're going to see another example of someone refusing good advice. They were given good advice and taking bad advice and see the consequences that happened as a result of that. This is with King Amaziah. Hopefully he's familiar to you since we just went through 1 and 2 Kings on our previous, uh, one of our previous Bible studies this year. Verse number 14, 2 Chronicles 25, verse number 14, the Bible says, Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods, and bowed down himself before them, and burned incense unto them. Of course, 
He defeats the people that were trusting in these so-called gods, right? And, and I, we, we talked about this before. How stupid is that? They couldn't save those people. And now you're going to make them your gods? Like they're going to be able to save you? It's ridiculous. But that's what he did foolishly. Verse number 15, which made God extremely angry because he was you know, setting up idolatry. Wherefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet. So God's trying to get through to him. He sends him a prophet. God's trying to send him a rebuke to say, you know, to get right with the Lord and to put away that idolatry. He's giving him a chance. He's sending someone to give him godly counsel because his life is headed the wrong way. He started getting into idolatry. He's getting into the wrong stuff. And God looks at him and says, I want to help this person, so I'm going to send a prophet. I'm going to send somebody to help set him straight. Which said unto him, halfway through 15, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass, as he talked with him, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear, why shouldest thou be smitten? So basically what he's saying is, shut up. He's like, oh, do you think you're one of the king's counselors? This prophet, he's like, you're not one of my, you're, you're not going to give me advice. So he says, forbear, it means like withhold. Don't, don't say anything more or else you're going to get hit. He says, why should you be smitten, right? I'll punch you in the face if you say one more word. Let's put it in the, in the that would be like the message, right? Or whatever. <laughs> put it into modern day English. And um, so that's what he said. And then it says, then the prophet forbear. So he said, okay, fine. I know that God hath determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. He's saying, you had an opportunity. I'm giving you good advice. I'm providing you godly counsel, but you're rejecting that. God's going to destroy you. Can you see how, how important getting godly counsel can be on your life? I mean, these are two examples. You might say they're kind of extreme examples, but look, the advice that you choose to take and especially the advice you choose to seek, I mean, that, that's going to help determine the course you're going to take. Otherwise, why would you be seeking counsel? I mean, you're looking for help. You're looking for advice. Where do you go to look for that advice? Well, first of all, when you hear the good advice, don't refuse it. Don't reject it. When it's coming from God's word, don't reject that counsel. And also, don't go seeking after from ungodly people. Verse 17 says, Then Amaziah, king of Judah, took advice. So look at this. Then he took advice. But you know what? It wasn't the godly counsel. Then he took advice and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face. And if you keep reading, you'll, you'll remember the stories like, you know, did the, the, the vine said to the thistle, or the, you know, the thistle said to the you know, like, and he puts that whole analogy, and he's like, look, you just had a great victory. Why don't you go ahead and just celebrate in that and don't get involved with us because we'll destroy you. And that's what happens. And, and Joash comes down and because... He just couldn't let it pass, and it was from the Lord that he was going to be defeated. Joash comes, defeats him, and takes him captive, and, and that's, that's pretty much it for Amaziah. I mean, his life ended up just being ruined as a result of that. Now, he lived for a while after that, but he lived in captivity and, and pretty much just ruined his life. He just came off a victory and then blew it by not accepting good counsel and um, looking at, the ba at, at the accepting bad counsel. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah, th there's, there's so much scripture on this. We're, not, we're definitely not going to cover it all, but um, I, I put uh, multiple examples in my notes because I really want to drive home the point of seeking godly counsel. When you have problems in your life, when you have things that are going wrong, especially when you are in a point where you're looking for a little bit of help, that you seek godly counsel and look there's nothing wrong we're going to see this in a minute when we get into proverbs there's nothing wrong with asking for advice there's nothing wrong with that now look i know personally and i know as a man that you want to do everything on your own because that's how we are that's how god programmed us we want to just you know like i don't want to look to anyone 
And, and I preached on this last week, you know, about bearing one another burdens and bearing your own burdens. And there's a point to where you want to be able to bear your burdens, but you need to be able to recognize there's also a point when you probably ought to start asking for counsel. Because it doesn't mean that you're not bearing your burden, but you're asking for advice on how to bear that burden. You're not giving it up. But we could all use a little help sometimes to just get some clarity on what the right, you know, if you know this is right and you're, you know, like, this is the right course, I know I need to do this, great. Amen. But you're not always going to know because, like I said, in personal situations, sometimes things seem a little bit different to you for different reasons and you just need someone to give you that good counsel again and just reaffirm and just be like, no, this, I mean, this is right. There's always some, you know, I've talked to so many people, there's always enough, there's always something that they, that wants to, well, this is why my situation is different. And 99% of the time, it's not. It's really just the same situation, but it's close to you. So you start thinking of other things. But um, did I have you turn to Isaiah chapter 30? Yeah. Look at verse number one, Isaiah 30, verse one. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They're already in sin. And he's talking about, they did seek counsel, but they didn't seek it from the Lord. So they're making their problem even worse because they didn't go to God to receive counsel from him to see, God, what do you have me for, for me to do? They sought it elsewhere, and elsewhere is going to be the world. Because anything that's not of the Father is of the world. And everything that's of the world is not of the Father. And by seeking this ungodly counsel, by, by going and getting advice and, and seeking to other people in God, they're adding sin to sin. Verse 2, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. All throughout Scripture, Egypt is a picture of the world, of everything that's worldly, of everything that's not godly. Egypt is the primary reference point to this is worldly. That's where the worldly believers wanted to go back into Egypt. Egypt is also a picture of just the might of the world, right? Putting your strength in Pharaoh and his armies. Even after the children of Israel came, were, um, you know, when, when most of them were taken captive already in Babylon and there's still a remnant and they're saying, you know, we don't want to fight this war anymore. We're going to go into Egypt. And God's saying, look, if you go into Egypt, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. But if you stay here and get planted down and listen to me and listen to my instructions, you'll do well. I'll build you up again and, and, and things will get better. But they chose the ungodly source. They, they, they're like, nope, we want to go into Egypt. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He's saying they go down to Egypt. They're just looking for the world's advice. Don't get caught up. Look, there's a lot of commercialism and marketing in this world to sell you all kinds of things, to make things look really good. Even the counselors, the, the ungodly counselors of this world, oh, we're going to make your life so much better and, and you're going to be happy. And you go today, especially you go to these counselors, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to put you on drugs. Not even just try to work through your problems and go back to your childhood and everything's a problem because you got spanked as a child and that's why you're in the mess you are now, which goes completely against Scripture. And you know what? All these things that they tell you, go back and look them up. Why? The psychiatry, what is that based on? Ungodly principles ungodly, you know, acad academia that went on before them. I mean, you look at Sigmund Freud and you look at all these people who are these pillars in modern day psychiatry and, and these are, you know, various people that they're reading textbooks from. They're not Christian. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in this stuff. It's all just out of their own wicked hearts and their own, you know, I mean, you're trying to get someone to tell you What's the right way for me to go? What's the right path? I'm at a fork in the road. I don't know where to go. And by going to the world, by going to psychiatrists, by going out to the world, 
You're, you're, go, you're literally going up to someone that has blinders and saying, hey, lead me the way that I need to go. Show me the way. And they're going, you know, oh yeah, you go, you go that way. It's over here. Just, just walk this way. They have no idea. They can't see. They're blind. And if the blind believers are the blind, you know, both shall fall into the ditch. This is why we don't go to the unsaved and ungodly to seek counsel and advice. Now, sometimes people are forced into that because our government will force you to do things, you know, that, you know, from, from some other problem you get into. I remember when, when I got, uh, you know, a DUI a long time ago, they forced me to have to go to some alcohol counseling classes and stuff like that. But that was required by law. I had to do it. And the things that they were telling me, they weren't all necessarily bad, but none of it was from Scripture. None of it was from the Bible. None of it was godly counsel. None of it was telling me, you need to get right with God because that was my real problem. I was in rebellion to God. And when I left that class, it was a joke anyways. Do you think my habits really changed? Not at all. Not one bit. And I was saved at this point. Mind you, I was a saved, I was a believer. Okay? Now, had I gone to a church, if the government commanded me, hey, you need to go to a Baptist church and you need to, to listen to some counsel there, Amen. that would be way more effective of actually getting me to, to, to correct my problem and getting me on the right path than going to this alcohol class. The alcohol class didn't work. Guess what? It almost never works. Because it's just, it's just the wisdom of this world. That's not what we need. We shouldn't go seeking out this type of counsel. The Bible says in, uh, turn if you go to Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to spend some time in Proverbs. In 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. You can get the most wise, smart person in this world that's unsaved and ungodly and you're not going to want to get their counsel because the wisdom of this world, if someone, you know, take the person who has the most wisdom of this world, it's foolishness with God. So let's seek for real wisdom. <laughs> for real godly counsel that is going to actually help you. That's what we ought to be looking for. Proverbs 1, look at verse number 24. This is one more final um, illustration of how bad things go when we don't listen to God's counsel and we're not hearkening unto the Lord's instruction. Proverbs 1, verse 24 reads, Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught, that means to nothing, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. You didn't want to hear it. You didn't want to have anything to do with my, my, my counsel. Look at verse number 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. So God says, you know what? I'm reaching my hand out to you. I want you to understand wisdom. I want, I want to give you good counsel. I want to give you instruction. But when you say, nope, don't want it. I'm going to go off and seek the world. Then you get yourself into trouble. You have calamity. You have all kinds of problems. You know what God's going to do then? And if you don't realize that this is true, you don't know the God of the Bible, he's going to laugh and mock when you try to, oh, you know, I, oh, I screwed up. But look, God's like, I already gave you an opportunity. I reached out my hand. I tried to help you out, but you scoffed at me and refused me. So now you're going to wallow in the mess that you made for yourself because you didn't want to listen. This is what it's saying. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. 
They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And everyone, listen up. Kids, listen up. Because everyone wants to think that you always have second chances and no matter what you do, you, you get in all kinds of problems. Well, I, I know what I'll do. The next time I get in a lot of sin, the next time I don't want to listen to anybody who's trying to help me out and tell me that I shouldn't be getting to sin, well, it's fine because as soon as I commit that sin, then I'll just go back and be like, oh God, I'm sorry. And you think it's all going to be okay. And it's not. It's not. Because that's not how God operates. He tries to help you out before you get that bad. And when you start hearing the godly counsel, don't refuse it. Because he might just let you go through all the way in the mess that you made. Now, obviously, if you're saved, you don't lose your salvation. But I'll tell you what, you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to be blessed. What was the first verse of Psalm 1 saying? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's how you're blessed. When you don't take the ungodly counsel, but you take the godly counsel. And if we refuse the godly counsel, if we don't have anything to do with it, then when we get into trouble, he's going to make you go through it. You're going to see it to the end. Because you didn't want to listen. Let's look up in, in Proverbs 1 because it starts off the chapter giving you the good things, right? The good reasons. It ends off saying, okay, fine. You have nothing to do with me? Then just, you made your bed. Go ahead and lay in it now. And I don't care if you come to me. I'm not going to listen to you. It's too late. Proverbs 1, verse 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. If you have any understanding at all, you should be attaining to or looking for wise counsels, people who have wisdom to help you out. Not the wisdom of this world, but real wisdom from God's word. that are really going to help you out. Turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter number 11. Proverbs chapter 11, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So having people to provide you with advice, to help you with godly instruction is very good for you. We see that in Proverbs 11 there. It's, when you don't have counselors, when you don't have people to help give you some wisdom and impart some knowledge, the people fall. You fail. But when there's a multitude of counselors... And, and you don't have to just go, like, don't just go to the pastor to seek godly counsel. And look, the pastor's a great place to start. I mean, seriously, if someone who ought to know their Bible very well, it ought to be a pastor. You know, a pastor ought to have enough wisdom and knowledge from Scripture to help somebody out and to give them advice in a certain situation and to point you to God's Word and say, oh, yeah, what this situation you're describing to me sounds like, this verse and this verse from God's word can really help you and listen to that. But you don't just have to go to the pastor. Go to other people that you know know the Bible really well. I mean, there's other people in this church that, are, that know the Bible pretty well and, and are, and are well-read that can also help give you counsel and advice. So when you have a multitude of counselors, the Bible says that there's safety. It's a good thing. It's, it's going to help to keep you safe. Proverbs chapter 12, look at verse number 5. Proverbs 12, 5 says, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Wicked counsels, it's lies. It's not truth because they're not getting it from the true source. Proverbs chapter 19. I'm going to turn to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. It's going to make, you know, receiving instruction, hearing counsel, hearing advice is going to make you wise. 
They, it says in verse 21, there are many devices in a man's heart, nevertheless the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Many devices in man, man's heart comes up with all kinds of different ideas, all kinds of different things, but what's really going to stand, what's going to stand the test of time, what's going to stand as true is, is God's word, the counsel of the Lord, God's instruction. I mean, think about when we're going to seek advice, who better to go to Turn if you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, but who better to go to than the person whose name is counselor? As Isaiah 9, 6 famously says, for unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, his name shall be called, or excuse me, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Counselor is, is Jesus, one of Jesus' names that's given to him. He's a counselor. He's there to provide instruction, to help you out, to tell you which way to go. Why would we ever think to go anywhere but to Jesus with our problems and with our direction when his name is counselor? It would be foolish to do so. Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall, for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. This is again, this is talking about the false prophets, the prophets who were, which were preaching peace, peace when there is no peace there in Jeremiah. Verse number 16, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. So the source of these prophets' wisdom and their message or prophecies is not from God. So again, this is ultimately ungodly counsel. So even though they're pastors, right, they're still providing ungodly counsel because you have to judge is what this person's saying, is this preacher, is this pastor saying God's words and preaching the truth from God's words. And that's how you're going to know who to seek counsel from when you know what this book says for yourself. So many people are deceived these days in all kinds of different religions and by different priests and pastors and whatever, religious leaders. And the reason why is because they're trusting them to give them good advice and good counsel but they can't even recognize that they're, they're not even saved, they're false prophets, because they don't know the word for themselves. They're, they're ignorant. They can't see the, the, all the, the many places where they're just erring and, and not preaching the truth. So it's incumbent upon you, if you want to be blessed, to get in God's instruction and his word for yourself to help you to find the good counselors, which then with the good counsel, God the counsel will help you be blessed. So um, let's keep reading here though in, in verse number uh, 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. This is, this is the nice message, right? Oh, everything's just fine. Nothing, oh, God's not mad at you. God's not going to bring judgment against us. Everything's fine. We're going to live in peace. Everything's wonderful. Verse 18, for who, hath stood, for who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days he shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, and this is the point I want to get to, if they had stood in my counsel, if these prophets would have preached my word and my counsel and my advice, look at what it says, and had caused my people to hear my words, if they would have done this, if they would have provided good counsel to these people, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. That is what the godly counsel will provide. It's going to help you to turn from your evil ways. It's going to help you to get the sin out of your life. It's going to help you to get right with God. That's why we need godly counsel. Because when you get caught up in sin, 
Sin, lust, when it, you know, when it conceiveth, brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, it's going to destroy your life. If you allow sin to run rampant in your life, you will destroy your life. And God may even extinguish your life physically in this world if you just get stiff-necked at hearing clear instructions from his word and just refusing it and refusing it. And he'll probably destroy you in a way that's not very pleasant and you're going to be calling out to God and it'll just be like, you brought this on yourself. Let's go back to Psalms. Psalm 1. That was verse 1. Told you. So he says, not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, not, not to, to stand in the way of the sinner, not to, to sit, um, and I don't have the, sitteth in the seat of the scornful, Right? Don't do those things. But here's what you should do, verse number two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. So being a blessed man, being blessed by God, you're, seeking, you're not seeking bad counsel, but you're going to love the good counsel, the good instructions, the commandments of the Lord. Now, a lot of people who claim to be Christians will talk bad about the commandments. Oh, man, God, you know, there's all these rules you got to follow. You know, you ought not to, shame on you if you've had that type of an attitude. We ought to rather love God's commandments because he's telling us the right way. Yeah, but that means I can't drink and I can't do drugs and I can't do this and I can't be lazy and I can't just watch TV all day and, I, you know, because if I'm going to be listening to God's instruction, then I can't do all these things I want to do. Jonathan, hush your mouth. Go by mama. Right now. I can't do all these things. But if you love God, if you love his commandments, then you will start to do those things and your life will be much better. Because you'll be, you'll be blessed. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, you don't have to turn to Joshua 1, 8 says... This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. This book of the law. He says, this book of the law, don't let it depart out of your mouth. Meditate. I mean, how many people today do you think are meditating in God's law day and night? Not just night, not just day, day and night. He's saying, meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You need to be studying and read, not just reading, studying, meditating. Let it sink in regularly, day and night, in order for you to do the things that are written here so you could know it and know the right ways and not even be able to question it because you've meditated in it. And it says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. You'll make your way prosperous. Why? Because you're going to be blessed by God. Because you're listening to him. You're obeying his instructions. He designed us. He made us. He knows what's good for us. And he gave us the instructions on how to have a blessed life. Meditate in it. Know it. And do it. It's one thing to know things. It's another thing to actually do it and to put it into practice. And that's the most important part is, is actually following through with it. He says, then you'll have a good success. You want to have a successful life? Meditate in God's law day and night and do those things. You'll be very successful. You'll be blessed. Psalm 119, look at verse number 97. We're going to look at the, uh, the subsection called Mem. And I like that it's Mem because it, it, it helps me to remember you know, the, the various sections have, they're all about God's law. All Psalm 119 is about God's law, but they focus on some different aspects in the different sections a little bit. And uh, Psalm 119 really talks about, you know, I think of mem as memory. It's talking about you meditating in God's word and keeping God's word in your heart and the, and the value of that. So we're going to read this short section here, starting in verse number 97. The Bible says, Oh, how love I thy law. I love it. 
And that's not a feigned love in the Psalms here. It's not a fake love. It's, you know, some people say, oh, I love reading the Bible, and they actually despise it. It's actually just a big chore, and they don't, a burden, they don't want to do it. And you could search your own heart out, you know, if that's the case. And maybe that needs to change. Why don't you start with the heart? Because everything else is going to be meaningless if your heart's not right at the end of the day. I mean, if, you, if your heart's not in it, you can, you can read the Bible. I don't care how many times. If your heart's not in it, you're not going to receive anything from it. Let's start getting the heart right. Let's start loving it. Let, let's try to, let's, let's aim to have this type of an attitude where I say, oh, how love I thy law. I love God's word. I love it. I love when the light shines. I don't love the darkness. I don't want to just not have a light shine on me. I want the light to shine on me. I want God to expose the areas that are dark in my life so that I can get rid of the darkness and be full of light. And that's why I love God's law. That's why I love it. And because I love it, it is my meditation all the day. I'm doing the Bible memory because I'm meditating on it day after day after day, every, all day. It's something that's going through my mind. Verse 98. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. There's a lot of enemies, he's saying, but I am wiser than them. I'm smarter than them. Why? Because of God's commandments. Because of God's word. Because I have more truth than them. I have more knowledge than them. Because I know God's word, I'm wiser than my enemies. Which is going to help him to be able to overcome his enemies. It's going to help him to avoid the snares and the traps of the enemy. You think about um, Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a lot of snares and traps laid for him. Did he not? We had Sanballat and, um, and um, my mind is blank now, the other guys that were, that were over there when he was trying to rebuild Jerusalem, right? They're trying to get the work going and he had these other guys doing everything they could. First, they were mocking him and ridiculing him and they were sending letters to the king and they're doing everything they can to thwart his efforts to get that rebuilt. And they're even like sending someone in to give him bad counsel to give him bad advice, to go and hide, and to go and, and, oh, meet with these people over here. And they're trying to separate them so they could, you know, they're laying traps for them. Why did he not fall for any of them? Because he was wise in God's word. That's why. Because he was dedicated to getting the work done for the Lord and, and not letting anything distract him from it. And when, when he meditates in God's word, He's going to be wiser than his enemies. He's going to be able to see, foresee the traps that are being laid before him. But the simple will fall. The simple fall into the traps. Because they don't have the wisdom. They're just going to go for it like a, like a fly to the light, a moth to the flame, right? That's, that's how the simple go into sin. Oh, this is shiny and bright. This looks great. And then it destroys them. That's what happens to a moth. That's what happens to the simple man. Let's be wise and be like, oh wait, yeah, that looks kind of nice from here, but it's going to kill me when I get close to it. <laughs> Let's go do something else because I don't have anything to do with something that's going to destroy me. Let's keep reading here. Psalm 119, verse number um, 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. It's talking about this immense amount of knowledge and wisdom and understanding that he gets because he's meditating on God's word, because he's keeping God's word with him. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Great peace. Great peace. Who doesn't want to have great peace in your life? Just going through life day after day with great, just a peace. Great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. You want to have a blessed life? 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight, joy, is in the law of the Lord. And you are focused and dedicated to, to God's word. You love it because you know it's going to be beneficial. You know it's going to help you. You know you're going to be wise and be able to make the right decisions to avoid all the other problems. And those of us that are a little bit older, I know myself, definitely all of the thing, all the stupid mistakes that I wouldn't have had to make just with a little bit of wisdom. And we learn the hard way sometimes. But I don't want to learn the hard way. Learn the hard way is not fun at all. That's why it's called the hard way. <laughs> it brings you through places that you don't want to go, that you are not joyful at all. You actually get, can get really depressed and really down and, and, and your life becomes miserable and nothing's working out for you. You don't believe me? Try it out for yourself. Live a life of sin. Go ahead. I don't dare do that. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. We need to remind ourselves of that. Read, read Proverbs 1 again when you go home tonight to remind you that, you, you know, that God is not mocked. He will not be mocked. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that God's just going to be okay with you going off and getting into whatever sins you want. Well, I'm a child of God, okay. God's not mocked. Thankfully, He won't ever send your soul to hell, but He won't be mocked. You better, you better watch yourself. And of course, Psalm 19, verse 7, you have to turn there. Psalm 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord is great for letting us know that we're sinners and converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's testimonies, God's word will make you wise. I don't care what type of learning problems you've ha you have or have had, God's word will make you wise and will give you the best wisdom you could have. You know, we, we homeschool our children and you know, they learn a lot and there's a lot of things. And I'm not against learning things that are true that we don't use scripture to teach, you know, like mathematics and English and grammar and whatever, you know, all these various subjects that they're true. There's truth to it. You know, and we're not teaching them lies. And they'll be beneficial for them and they'll help them. But what I care more than anything about is that they're receiving instruction on God's word. You don't have to know very much math in this world to be successful. Again, I'm not against it. But I know where the priority is. The priority and the focus is going to be on let's get them to be very moral people, to know God's word, to know his commandments, because if they have this foundation, everything else will work itself out. They won't be stupid. They won't be idiots. They'll realize that there's value to learning other things and, you know, to, to learning and to just doing what's right. I mean, when they're, when, when they're serving the Lord, they'll be taken care of. I'm not going to have to worry about how good they're going to be with their finances if, they're, if they've got this book as their foundation because I know they're never going to be begging bread because if they're righteous, if they're living right, God will take care of them. Like Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Food, clothing, that'll all be provided for them. So if I can teach them to trust in this and to learn this and to live righteous lives, never have to worry about them going hungry ever in their life. As long as they adhere to this. And so much more. I mean, I go on and on and on. Um, this is the source of what, this is what we should be seeking to for counsel. You want advice in your life? Are you going through problems? Are you going through hard times and you need someone to help you out and to tell you what's right? Turn to the, this book. Turn to someone who knows this book. And don't get hard-hearted or stiff-necked to the instruction found in this book. Usually the instruction is easy. The hard part comes in following through and doing it. That's usually the case. And that's why people, even Christians, will, you know, will turn to the ungodly counsel because the godly counsel is just something they don't want to do because it's either too difficult or whatever.
whatever the case may be. It's just, for whatever reason, it's too hard. So they want something a little bit easier. Oh, yeah, I'll go listen to this person. He's going to tickle my ears. He's going to tell me something that, that isn't going to actually confront the root of the problem like this book will. I could just go kind of try to ignore my problems and deal with it some other way. And when you go off, you, your problem will not be solved. I'll just tell you that right now. If you, if you don't get to the root of the problem that the Bible points out and just go seek ungodly counsel, you will not solve your problems. If you want to get over it as quickly as possible, seek it from God's word. Psalm 1-3, we're almost done. This is again talking about the blessed man that, that meditates in God's word and attains unto godly counsel. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. You're going to be bountiful. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be bringing forth fruit. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That sounds great. Sign me up. It only took two verses in this psalm. And a lot of me <laughs> speaking and going other places, but ultimately the, the concepts are there. Psalm 1-1 one, one, one and 1-2. Being blessed for, for receiving this type of blessing. And, and whatsoever you do would be prosper. What, you know, having good success. And of course, we'll just reread these last three verses. I covered them at the beginning. Uh, the ungodly are not so. That's not the way the ungodly is going to turn out. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. They're going to be tossed. They're going to be blown away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's bow our heads. Have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great wisdom that we can receive and the instruction that we get from your words. Lord, help us. Help us to strengthen our spirit. Help us to love your law and to, to meditate in it day and night, dear Lord, and to treat your words as, as the life-providing uh, words that they are that, that can lead us in all the right paths and help us to avoid so many snares and traps and, and mistakes that we make in our life. Help us to get this wisdom and Lord, when, when we are facing problems, God, I pray that you would please help us to seek godly counsel and um, to just understand what it is, that, that the, the way that you would have us to go, Lord, and to, um, and to just have that understanding. Lord, we ask that you'd open up wisdom and knowledge unto us, especially now as, as we're trying to complete our challenge of reading the entire New Testament in 31 days. Help us to stay on course with that and that it wouldn't be a burden or a chore, but that we'd actually look forward to it, that we'd wake up in the morning and go, yeah, I want to finish this challenge, but I love this part of the day. I love the part of the day where I could hear from God and then later in the day, hear from God again and then in the evening, hear from God again. Hear instruction and is to receive and just know that the more we read, the more we study, the more we're going to retain and the more it will help us in our lives, dear Lord. Thank you so much for giving us this instruction and this wisdom to help us out in our lives, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.